Good morning, Michelle. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Michelle? I'm good. I am just so happy that we're on take maybe four <laughs> of this introduction <laughs> part of our interview. Um, but you know what? It just, for me, it gives me more time with you and it makes me, um, our interactions just make me smile because I see a lot of myself in you. You're so real. Thank you. Um, I, I think authentic um, interaction and like, like people just being there for each other is so important, especially when there's so much social media that is, you know, not real to some degree. And there is some really good social media, but there's a lot of bad. Mm -hmm. And I think we're not everybody's grounded and trying to drive purpose. And I think when you find people like that um, within the community, um, through events like we did, um, and, and you're just trying to drive good into the world, I think you just naturally connect. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Like showing up as you are. But I think that takes courage, like having, and confidence, by the way, like having the um, vulnerability to like show up and and not like, not try to pretend. And I guess that's because both you and I know ourselves so well that um, really doesn't require anything more than that, right? Yeah, I think when you come into a situation where you don't know anybody, you just have to be really open to, mm -hmm. to be inquisitive, to uh, introduce yourself and to meet other people. Because I think that's the purpose of getting together, right? Like connecting with other people, helping them connect to others. Um, so yeah, it should be quite natural, I think. But yes, if you're grounded, if you know who you are and spent time uh, ensuring, you know, what you want to bring to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, to our audience out there, I'm so blessed to have uh, become acquainted and uh, becoming fast friends with Michelle Bayo, who is the founder of a fintech company and a payment consultancy company uh, located in Toronto, actually, in Canada. And we were lucky enough to uh, meet one another through Women's Entrepreneurship Day. And she was one of the featured speakers talking about uh, FinTech and, um, and such at that and how that uh, can impact future leaders and women and women actually entering into that category. So um, Michelle and I, we as per usual with most people with me, we sort of uh, immediately connected and we were blessed enough to be around one another with her mother, which was super cool. And her mom um, was there to support her in um, her presentation, but also uh, you were sort of modeled being an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, it was, um, first it was so lovely to meet you. And the fact that I got to meet you at my first time ever speaking at the UN on International Women Day uh, in New York was, was so powerful. And because I, I got this honor of being a speaker, um, I was able to bring um, nine people to come join me at my table. So I brought eight clients uh, and my mom um, because it was her 75th birthday because she was an entrepreneur. Um, and I grew up with my, with my mom being an entrepreneur that inspired my dad to become an entrepreneur. And, and then I went the opposite path and went and spent 20 years in the corporate space uh, before I felt like I had the confidence um, to, to come in being an entrepreneur myself. So it was, it was so special to have her there. And it's the first time she's ever come to anything in 20 years of work. Um, so it was, it was really special. And she's like, I actually, I kind of think I know what you do. <laughs> Cause for the last three years as the CEO of Innovator, she's like, what is payments and open banking? And, and what do you exactly do? And, and so it was really great to be up on stage talking about uh, fintech and open banking and web three and how it can empower consumers and how women can get involved um, by simply applying to some of these jobs because it's just as complex as going to work for a cell phone company or going to work for um, you know an engineering company where you there's still skills that women bring to the table naturally um, that can flow into any industry even though they look complex so inspiring more women to come into finance, to come into Web3, uh, to come into open banking is is something I'm very passionate about. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly you were nominated one of the top 
30 CEOs from the Silicon Valley last year. So that's pretty impressive when we look at that, right? It's It was, right? Top 30 best CEOs. So I 2021. think- 2021. Oh, 2021. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I think that the thing is, is that when we think about that, that says a lot about your leadership style and also about your uh, ability to give back to others and your ability to actually open a new market uh, and expand it in a way that people uh, can receive it more. So um, kudos to you on that. That's a big deal. Thank you. I, I feel like, you know, there's some, there's this part of entrepreneurship that's super scary, right? Um, because you're out on your own um, and and it's it's scary, but there's also this part that's about creation um, and that's so rewarding. And I think um, you can create something out of nothing, right? Like I, Absolutely. I created Finnovator um, after winning Money 2020 Rise Up where they picked 30 women out of 500 around the world. And I was kind of, shocked and excited that they had selected me, but then didn't want to give the the PR to the startup that I was working with at the time because I was an employee and I'd always wanted to be a CEO. Um, and so I took that opportunity and in 24 hours, I started Finnovator and I had never been a consultant and I had no friends who were consultants, but I knew that my background of 20 years in the corporate space six years in telco, eight years in online shopping, ran Alaska, Lufthansa, Delta United online shopping malls, um, and then worked in the prepaid space uh, for one of the largest prepaid players in the world and, and ran those gift card towers that you see at Walmart, 7-Eleven, helped with marketing and sales and, and launched new digital products for the B2B space. Got to see so much of the world uh, through working for them and seeing what was happening in their 30 other countries. But then moving after I saw all of the Asian products and the Asian infrastructures of fintechs, I got really nervous that North America was largely behind both our banks, our credit unions, um, just a lot of band-aids and, and not a lot of full steam solutions that will drive innovative products to the future. And I, I took a leap of faith and, and jumped into a blockchain company. And through that move, I was super nervous and mass risk, I but I learned so much in that mass risk. And it's like this roller coaster ride where you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there, but you're growing because through fear is education. And then mm -hmm. if you can learn from what that fear drove, what you're able to build, then you could just build upon that. So when I won and started Finnovator 24 hours later, I created something. And mm -hmm. then through that creation authentically, brought in half female, half male staff and tried to drive education of, you know, future of finance, future of payments, and how can I help Canadian U.S. banks and fintechs and banks work closer together so consumers win uh, more often. Yeah, I think the thing that you bring up about addressing the fear, and it's so easy for all of us to immediately say no, like our ego takes over and we just go, oh, no, I don't even understand what that's about. I am just going to, you know, whoa, you know there's a few different types of people, right? But a growth mindset is one of which that we're going to stop and we're going to be like, what part of this do I need to understand, if not all parts, right? To step in, to create something new like you did, um, to, to further the future of so many lives, right? And I think the thing is, is that um, I encourage more people to step into their fear, right? So if we use our interaction as an example, you know, I told you before we got on the call, like I knew nothing about blockchain, W3, um, payment processing, any of it. Right. And I was like, why am I around all this? Why does this? <laughs> so I got curious. Right. I was like, I need to understand more about this. Like, even though it was one of those, honestly, because of probably my age, rare moments where I was standing there going, whoa, this is stuff I know nothing about and I need to be educated. There's a large percentage of the room that that is what they do for a living. So how do you connect? How do you understand one another so that I could speak your language, right? And I think you bring up a really good point about um, whether it be payment processing, W3, whatever it is, there's an opportunity for women to not be afraid, going back to fear, but to learn. 
and that yeah, we have I, skill sets that men don't have in that way or different. We have the communication skills in a different way and we have yes. empathy in a different way. And we are, you know, we want to be perfectionists. So we're great researchers before we say something. So mm -hmm. we add so much to panel discussions, um, but we don't put our hand up enough to want to be on the panel. So another thing that I'm, I'm really passionate about is if I get brought to a panel, because I just started speaking, it was one of my goals in 2017 uh, when I was at that prepaid company. And I was like, I read Grit by Angela Duckworth. And it's one of my favorite books because it talks about this mastery of 10,000 hours of doing anything. Um, and you're always going to be fearful when you're at the beginning of any 10,000 hours. But once you start digging and I, I put the goal in January and by August, somebody invited me to come speak on a panel um, in, in the US um, close to Boston. And it was about prepaid. So it was at least my expertise. Yeah, exactly. But it, but it was at seven in the morning on the last day of a three-day conference um, oh. to 200 regulators. Um, so 7 a.m., you know, I took at least 10 paragraphs of notes. I read them, I reread them, I rewrote them. I was rewriting them at 6.45 in the morning just before oh. I was getting on stage. And one of our panelists didn't show up. So it ended up being Mackenzie, the person who invited me, who was a CEO and expert and myself filling up an hour at 7 a.m. Um, and everybody was in the room in suits. And but I'm sure, but I am sure knowing you that you can, first of all, you can, uh, uh, you're so engaging preparation or not, you know, um, yeah. somebody shows up or not, you can command a stage for an hour. Thank you. It, well, you know what it was, it was because I had done that research, I was able to teach them about WeChat. I was able to teach them about Alipay, um, because it was so new to the market at the time they, they weren't aware of it. So I was able to bring in this knowledge with a lot of quotes and a lot of numbers. And I think that's what women do to a panel is we bring a lot of specific research and it brings a lot of value. So when I get asked to join a panel, I ask, can we make this panel, you know, diverse? I'm happy to help you. I'm happy to, you know, recommend some people. And then I dig in my network and like pull some people out and say, you know, you really should try joining me on this panel. And they're like, Ooh, I'm not ready. I know I want to speak, but maybe next year I'm like, you know what, I'm here, I'll help you, but just say yes. And then once they do their first one, watching them kind of grow and getting more women out there talking about finance, talking about, you know, all of these different complexities, the knowledge that's being shared is impressive. Mm, yeah. I, I love, um, I love that you, specifically sought out to have at least a 50 50 company meaning 50 percent males and 50 percent females and you're kind of speaking about how that then parlays to even when you do speaking engagements because anything that we put out as far as like when we think of intentions right we think of goals right has to actually have a thorough thread through everything we do and so many people only do it in uh, silos in one thing so hearing you say that it's such a beautiful um, testament, again, to your leadership style and how you approach problem solving, right? And providing opportunities and solutions. So when you decided to start Finnovator, can you give me a little perspective on, because most of the audience is not going to know what the difference is between blockchain and W3 and payment processing and any of it. So can you give like a top line, this is what it's about? Yeah, so I, to bring it down simplistically, it's payment innovation. So you're a consumer. Um, most people use PayPal. PayPal was a, a fintech created to protect your credit card so that you could shop online, but your credit card information was never shared. It was uh, run through PayPal. They were the only ones with your data. So that protected you from shopping and giving your information to 15 different sites. So that's, you know, they were a fintech. Um, and one of the, the probably first fintechs in that perspective. Um, so there's fintechs who solve a problem um, like PayPal. Um, you might be using other fintechs for, um, you know, different parts of your financial services without even knowing it. Um, like maybe for your kids, you might be using Greenlight so that they have a prepaid card where you could put their allowance and then their allowance um, gets deposited digitally, but it goes into a wallet you both see 
and it gets split out to they could spend 50% of it, but 25% goes to savings and 25% goes to a big goal they have. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a mass US organization and it, it's called a challenger bank. So cool. it's not a core bank, it's a mm -hmm. fintech bank mm -hmm. um, that just does something super specific um, to help a market. So they're, they're trying to just help teens um, manage money yeah, exactly. and understand money. And parents who don't want to give their kids cash, um, they don't know where it goes. They give them digital allowance and now they're able to see where their kids are spending their money. They're able to coach them on, you know, spending your entire, you know, um, money on Starbucks is probably not the best use of, of how you could spend your money. Maybe starting to teach them about stocks through um, Robinhood um, and all of these different fintechs that have enabled themselves in the US and around the world to help consumers save money, understand money, uh, get better we'll access to like different Venmo services. falls underneath that. Yep, Venmo falls underneath that as well. Um, and so that's the simple piece because you guys like consumers touch fintechs every day, whether mm -hmm. they, they kind of know it or not. Um, when you look at blockchain, a little bit more complex um, and it will bring us into web three. So mm -hmm. the internet in 1989 was super basic. Nobody had ever heard of it. Only people really deep into understanding the technology were the ones utilizing it. Uh, governments were utilizing it, but very small amounts. You would never have pictured yourself using the internet every single day, let alone your grandmother calling you through WhatsApp um, using the internet, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 20 years down the road. So the internet evolved and through this evolution, um, you were able to then make payments um, not just have a stagnant website, which is kind of web one. Web two was interactive. So you were able to, you know, have a profile on Roblox and play digital games with your friends and make payments online. So that's web. This is the current web we live in. Web three um, is actually enabling your digital identity um, in a safe and secure way um, so that you can not have to give your data every single place you go. Um, you could kind of authenticate once um, and then kind of use a QR code or different things to enable so you don't have to give your identity. You're starting to see it in like when you go to sign in with your phone, it's like, do you want to sign in with your Apple ID so you don't have yeah. to, do you want to hide your your email so address so that or whatever? Yeah, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. So it's keeping a layer between you and the person you're talking to. So you're not giving Marriott all of your information and then there's 7.6 million dollar or million data breach um, and all the data breaches right so if the data you're giving them is proxy data mm -hmm. so a kind of an email address that is only used once and points back to you but they can't really find you um, it doesn't really give information so we're starting to get into an era where we're trying to get our autonomy back mm -hmm. a little bit um everything and I'm yeah so <laughs> Let's hope. So there's a really interesting thing that just happened in the US. Um, another thing I focus on is open banking, open data, which is consumer data rights. So consumers actually owning their data so that uh, this happened in Australia. It was the first country in the world to enable it back in uh, 2020. Um, and they launched this as consumers in Australia have a consumer data right as of 2020 started with open banking, went to open energy, open telco, and then open data. So what that means is you as a consumer own your data and you could tell the bank that you're moving from Bank of America to Chase and you don't want to start fresh at Chase. You want Chase to know your name, have your information, and be able to give you the products that most matter to you now instead of them just starting you off fresh like you spent 20 years with Bank of America, you're going off to Chase. They have no idea who you are other than you live in California. This is your name and you exist. Exactly. So what open banking is, is allowing you to port and move that data on your request with consent from that bank to the other bank, but with your consent to actually know who you are. Mm. So it's not, it's like allowing you to sign in without you filling out 17 trillion forms. So, so 
so how does one enlist in that? Like, how do you go, okay, that's the direction I want to go. And I want to make sure that my data is secure. So you, do you pick like a certain app or external banking system or payment processing system consultancy to sign up with, and then therefore they control the data or how does that work? Yeah. So this system is live in Australia, the UK, um, Brazil, Europe, New Zealand, and it's being worked on in Canada. And it's just been announced in the US at Money 2020, which is the largest payments conference in October in Vegas, that they're going to have a consumer data right in the US by 2024, meaning that consumers will own their data. There will be legislation that mandates that the data is owned by the consumer. You've probably heard of GDPR because you're in marketing yeah. uh, in Europe and how complex that is because the consumer owns the data and you're not allowed to use it in, in forms where it will be misused and the consumer doesn't know about it. So like third party selling of your data is not allowed in Europe. So this is a kind of a form of that. It's not fully in the US yet, um, but you won't need an app. It will just be because it, the system will be enabled and there'll be rules and laws and it will actually be really protected. Um, when you go to Chase, you'll just be able to click a box saying, yes, I consent to have my data um, moved from this bank to this bank. Mm -hmm. um, and this consent is a one-time consent. And then I'd like you to delete my data after um, the use of it to get me my products. Is that so a little it, bit it's like when you use Zelle or... Um... You know, because Zelle is more secure than using Venmo. Uh, so, it, and I know that a lot of people refuse to use Venmo because of that, um, because they're because of their data breach and things like that. So um, is it a little bit like that where you would be able to control where your data goes? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I would say they're trying to front run what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. um, because it's going to be mandated that that data sharing doesn't just happen in an unsecure way, which is called screen scraping. There's actually going to be a mandate for the API to be the same API used um, and protected uh, between institutions. So APIs are safer, can't be hacked as easily if hacked. Like there hasn't been any APIs data breaches. What's the acronym stand for? Um, application. Oh, uh, now it's you're a, getting technical on me. I'm sorry, um, but I'm just wondering, it's, just so that for people to understand better. Fair. I, you know, I probably have never said the actual breakdown of API, but it's an application processing. I'm not going to lie. I won't guess on it. Incorporated. But it, what it, <laughs> yeah. What it is largely is a data pipe. Think of it as the pipe that water goes through. This is the pipe that data goes through. Uh, and it's a safe and secure pipe that's locked and certified on both ends of where it's going. Mm. Um, and it's probably better than the actual word of its terminology. Mm. Okay, I like that. It, no, it's a good visual. Like, I think it's important for people to understand. So, because I know that there's a lot of, there's, I feel like there's two sides of this where it's like, some people are super like, very protective of their information, very protective of how their money is being transferred and all that. And then you have other people that are just like, oh, it's so much easier. Who cares? And um, I think you, in some ways, you need to educate yourself and not be on either side of that, but like know what you're getting into. It's a little bit like we talked about before we got on the call, just as far as like security breaches, even on like applications and stuff um, and gaming with your kids. Um, yeah, I, I think like from a security standpoint, I guess, just because I do work with some banks, most people have VPNs and they're so easy to get and you could get them through Norton antivirus or other protective infrastructures, which it just doesn't reveal your where you are from your ID of your internet IP, which mm -hmm. is your address, like your online address gets protected. Just like when I was talking about using PayPal um, and they're the ones who hold that information, but when they share it outwardly, it doesn't show your actual credit card. So this is a VPN protects your actual um, online address from, and it should be on all of your kids' devices because you never want it to show exactly where they are. And the other thing I do with my kids is I, I have their password or they're not allowed to have a phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I could go check it out whenever I feel like it. Not that I, I do too often because I have scared them quite a bit um but the other thing is I don't let them have location um 
per, per, like precise location turned on on any of their apps. Um, and I don't have their camera or microphone turned on on apps unless they're using them. Um, and it has so to be like on, way. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, just like a double check from that perspective, because I think the whole purpose of moving to a Web3 perspective is is to give you more security. And it's a lot that I've shared, but to get to your That's other good. point on, um, you know, Web3 is also, I would say open finance is the financial world talking about data. Mm -hmm. um, Web3 is the move for it to be online, but it's also the way that crypto organizations are talking about the same kind of movement. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, I'd say they're similar, right? Mm -hmm. um, open finance is the financial banks talking to each other, the wealth companies with these secure pipes locked on both sides. Um, and then Web3 is that being utilized online. And when crypto companies talk about it, they're they're talking about um, being able to utilize that when you're signing in um, and you want to use crypto, but use it anon anonymously to maybe buy virtual space or tokens or these different things. So what I, what I say on any emerging tech is always be cautious um, and always learn because there's been a lot of challenges within that space, um, just like any emerging space, you saw the dot-com boom, there was, uh, you know, 90% of those companies went under because they couldn't sustain themselves. But then you got the the PayPal, the Facebooks, um, and all the other companies in Amazon that did make it through that first round. Um, crypto winter has already happened a couple times, and it's bringing to the forefront the companies that will have long longevity, I would say. Um, and, and like but, related, because crypto is so controversial. Um, like when we talk about that, like what are some companies that um, are more reputable that you could think of if you were interested in entering that space and curious at all to kind of follow their their lead? Just curious. Yeah. So for me, I would say in general, any any space. There's so many podcast panels. Um, different pieces around the world that you could attend for free um, so that you could learn more about what is blockchain, what is crypto. Crypto is just one use case of what can be enabled on a blockchain. It's not the only one. It's just the one that's got um, the most um, media and the most you know, visibility. But to me, crypto is really loyalty, like to, to bring it down to a point where people will understand it from a description point. Like if you have uh, mileage plus miles, right? You earn them every time you fly, you earn them every time you do something. Uh, it's a currency in a way um, that has a set value that was created um, that you could then turn into other things, maybe flights, maybe gift cards, maybe a meal or two. Um, but it's a, it's a loyalty infrastructure that was created um, and has a community, right? Yes. So crypto is a digital token that was created for a community, used for a community, and has a value based on how much it's utilized or what it's utilized for. Um, it's my best description of it. I, I wouldn't promote any one crypto company, I would say. There's, there's some crypto companies that are now paying you for every step you take. Mm -hmm. um, so they're trying to get into the fitness space and uh, it's a crypto token, so every step that goes from your Apple um, of how many steps you did for the day, they give you X amount of this token. And then the token turns into, um, you could buy different parts, like advantages within their app kind of thing. So kind of it's loyalty being yeah. utilized uh, well, back it's and forth. interesting because so. I know that you came from, um, I love the fact that we have a little bit of technical conversation because I think that this topic of, uh, payment processing consultancy, but also like what you do is the consultancy part of it is so rich and so meaty and it's only going to get more and more. I mean, the exchange of actual money is becoming less and less. Right. And um, and the accessibility to be able to pay for things, whether that be through Apple Pay or different ways is 
um, just frankly, like there's an ease of use for people, right? And they don't have to go to the bank to go get money and all of that. So the education part of it, it's really important. So um, I, I really am grateful that we're kind of taking people through that. The one thing that um, I would say is, um, you know, you have to stay on the top of trends. Clearly, it's like, you're not in necessarily the crypto space, um, but you're in fintech, which also incorporates that. So you need to know about a lot of different categories, right? So how do you stay on the top of trends? Because any female entrepreneur that starts any kind of business, whether that be me in the coaching space, needing to follow all these other, you know, very large people, right? And, and up and coming so that I can stay on the top of what is relevant for people in personal growth. How do you stay on the top of your game? Like edu constantly educating yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, at a lot of conferences um, because I think that if A, from a speaking perspective, I'm always trying to push myself um, and also trying to bring different parts of industries together so that if I could bring them a little bit of knowledge of fintech um, and what is open banking or open finance, and they could tell me a little bit more about what's now happening in blockchain or web three or what's happening in food tracking for source through blockchain. Uh, to give an example, um, I have a friend who is uh, Ecuadorian and she's helped with her organization to use blockchain to track the source of the grain to the food to where it went on the conveyor belt to which uh, warehouse to then which grocery stores to kind of be the, the source of information to prove what is in a product, where did it come from and its authenticity. Uh, so blockchain is being utilized in, in many different ways, but as you go to more conferences and you take in more information, because that's where they bring the best use case, the most information, right, is in person and getting to meet other people that you probably wouldn't have. Um, there, There's a lot of great insight there. And then there's a lot of virtual conferences that you can attend, like I said, in Europe or Brazil, that um, they still have an English version and you're still able to ingest this information. Uh, there's a lot of people I follow on LinkedIn that are just great at sharing um, really relevant insights. I also, as my team at Finnovator, we also look at, you know, trends and, and try and drive out and share insights through our monthly newsletters to try and help people who are not doing all of this mm -hmm. um, get a quick glimpse on, on what's happening in the market. Yeah. So I think it's surrounding yourself um, with different people. Yeah. And I think when you talk about surrounding yourself with different people, like what do you think drives not just your success, but the success of others? Like, how would you recommend somebody, you know, you're not, uh, you're, you're, you're a very driven person. And that's clear. Um, just listening to some of the things that you're saying, you measure your success. I can tell like you're constantly um, trying to figure out what's next for you. How do you feel like if you were to say, this is the formula to success, what does that look like? And obviously it's different. Yeah. For person, but I think it's different. I, I, what I think I realized is different stages of my life. I thought of what success is slightly mm -hmm. differently. And I think at this point, being a CEO for three years, running my own company, having, two kids, you know, 10 and, and like 13 and a husband. Um, there's a lot of things I'm juggling in my life. And I realized that the, the core check mark of success is balance. Um, and I don't think a lot of people talk about it in that way or look at success in that manner because you could be so busy, you have no home life. You you could not be busy and, and not have the, the work piece. So I think it's trying to figure out where can you fill your cup and, and then where can you give back? So for me, because I lived in the corporate space, which you did as well, I gave a lot, right? Yeah. I, I traveled a lot. Um, I always felt like I had to give more uh, to get higher. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was working, you know, not not the greatest of hours and getting online the after the kids <laughs> it's the yeah. antithesis of balance right the opposite of balance was what I was living in the corporate world and when I went out on my own even though I was starting from nothing and I didn't take investment and I just literally grinded until I got some revenue um, and that's how I built the company 
Um, so I'm a self-funded CEO um, growing an organization and it was still about balance. I still had my weekends. I still had my nights unless I was at a conference and I, I very intently shut down at that five, five thirty mark. And I'm just with the kids um, and till they go to bed. And then I'm about reading or meditating so that I could picture what I want to facilitate in like the next day. And I wake up and I do that same next meditation, get the kids to school, come back, do a full day that is largely back to back uh, and intentional and then shut it down at five um, book nights with girlfriends, book date nights with my husband. And I, I think it's having that balance and knowing you have those things that help you go full tilt from that 8.30 to, to 4.30 or nine to five kind of play. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think you're the only person I've ever met that's actually mentioned balance as the key uh, pathway to success. And um, gosh, that's maybe another reason why we really connected when we met because I committed to that after leaving the corporate world that I would always be intentional about where I invest my time and try to find the balance. It's not easy, right? Um, and it's a choice, a conscious choice. And I love the fact that you shut down at five. I, I myself know I should probably be better about that. However, um, you're right. You have to make a concerted effort and choice of where you invest your time and the balance is what makes us whole i always say that that's what empowers about why is it business and wellness and why do i feature both types of people it's it's the integration because if we don't have both we won't be whole right and um i it's a it's a goal to strive for is balance it's almost like when people say like oh happiness is the holy grail right i actually think balance is is incorporated in that happiness. Yeah, because I, I I think like I took two weeks off for the mm -hmm. holidays, like fully took two weeks off. Um, but that was my time with my kids, and my husband, where I was not traveling, where I was not at a conference, um, where I was not on my phone. And that filled me up. Mm -hmm. uh, it was hard. Like it's always hard to shut down uh, fully as a Especially CEO. During that time of year, by the way, too. Yeah, but I, I think I trust. Yeah, I trust in my staff, and I I pre set up to ensure that that's what I was doing. So my my clients knew I was going away, and and like this was the time. Um, so I I think by by making sure like when they say put your mask on first when you're like getting oxygen from the plane, and then you can help others. It's so true, right? Like you have to fill your cup. You have to feel grounded. You have to know what you want so you can lead your team. So you can be present for your kids because that's what you're doing all of this for right at the end of the day um and and time with your husband and, and just my friends are so crucial um mm -hmm. because my husband you know is not in the fintech space he's a musician so he does not want to talk about fintech infrastructures um so i i thankfully have a lot of girlfriends who happen to be in the industry and we go out and and get to talk about the industry in general, which allows you to kind of decompress. And I also have a CEO coach. So mm -hmm. um, I have that intentional practice of looking back at the week and looking forward mm -hmm. um, so that I try and drive the most out of what I'm doing. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, a community network of people, I mean, we know that connection is core to the human existence, right? And uh, while we're so connected technologically these days, we're disconnected at the same time um, from a true uh, authentic conversation, right? And I guess that's that whole showing up vulnerably and all that that we talked about earlier. So it's um, great to hear you say that you have a um, community support not of women also in tech, which is amazing and also a coach. So what made you decide to hire a coach? Curious, Lee. Good question. Um, so the reason I started my company and took this leap of faith after 20 years of being in the corporate space, trying to climb the ladder, um, my, my best friend passed away from cancer um, mm -hmm. and she passed away when she was 36 and she was six since she was 32. And she was an artist. Um, 
and Shannon was aspiring to be a university professor, um, but was a secretary um, and never realized her dream of being an artist mm. until she got diagnosed. Mm. Um, and then she felt the right to just be an artist for four years and her art is beautiful. And she touched me in so many ways. And she was the person I called when I had success. And I remember I used to call her at 8.30 in the morning on my drive to work because it was the only time I had between my corporate job and the kids. And um, she'd say, why do you work so much? Mm. Like, where's like, why? Why do you work so much? And, and when are you going to stop uh, to live life? And I heard it but it didn't impact me until mm -hmm. she wasn't here anymore. And I was devastated, obviously. Um, and then I won money 2020 and I just went, that's it. It's me time. I, I, I left like within 24 hours, the other company I was grieving. Um, I was excited to have won. And I just went the The rest of my life is going to be about me building something for the future. Mm. Um that I can leave a legacy, that I can leave this to my kids if they so chose, um, that I would build something. Mm -hmm. Because um, one of her art pieces, which I bought said, um, there's a quiet security knowing that you're part of something bigger. Mm. And I wanna be focused on that mm. in honor I have, of her. Um, I, ha I have such chills going from my arms down my legs and um, uh, just hearing that, is so powerful to understand where where your drive came from. Yeah, and then it, it was interesting because I was I'm recalling it's actually making me tear a little bit. I was recalling when we met in New York, you telling me the story about your best friend, but there was so much noise around because we were in that crazy house, um, and we were at a party, obviously. But um, yes. but. Um, I really feel that in my heart about um, how that really resonates in your core um, of why you wanted to start Finnovator and what a beautiful message that you're bringing forward and, and why so many people are touched by you. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I think it's still pretty fresh for me, even though it's it's been a while. It's been like almost um, three and a half, four years. Um, but yeah, that, that's how you could see the power of how one person can affect even when they're not present anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, um, I'm just so grateful that I had her in my life and I, I still have her as an inspiration. Um, cause I think once we focus on what we want to do, um, or kind of look at the world, like, oh wait, we're part of something bigger. Like, how do we actually give back or drive towards that statement, it grounds you. Um, yeah, I think yeah. what happens is, um, so it's so interesting. Like when I decided to do the podcast, I intentionally wanted to feature people that have uh, maybe elevated to a certain level in their career and other people that are just getting started. And I think uh, something that you just said that, um, one person can make an impact in the world and in your life. And even if they're present or not still, because the energetic exchange that you felt still lives on and the memory continues to drive you towards something greater. And I think that's why being purposeful and having intention is so important. I so agree. Um, I, I think 2023 is going to be a challenging year for many, but I think it can also be a transformative year if they really sit in what they want to give back. Um, because 2008 was a, a challenging year for many, but I think many came out of it with a different perspective. I think COVID was challenging for many years. Um, so I, I think it's just about knowing what you're trying to drive towards. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a goal. Um, I think one of the practices that grounds me is every year I write 10 things I want to achieve 
and I kind of have a word of the year and that kind of guides me. My blog me. post was about yesterday. Oh, <laughs> love See, that. You're right, on, you're right on cue. It's almost <laughs> like you knew, but you didn't. It's amazing. Yeah, so it's it's something I, I kind of pulled out of that book from Angela Duckworth in 2017. And I attribute my success to writing down my goals and then keeping myself accountable, not to achieve all of them, but if you write it down, it becomes so much more mm. real. Um, and then to look at it and look back on it, A, it can be really rewarding if you look back a couple of years and see what you've done, uh, but it can also be really motivating. Um, it doesn't have to be daunting. This is not like you have to achieve all 10 of them by March 31st of the same exactly. year. This is like a progression play. And some of mine from last year ended up on this year. Um, I think it's just intention. Yeah. And I think it's about giving ourselves grace as we going back to balance, uh, flow through balance in our lives, knowing that you can't always achieve everything that's on your list. And uh, usually the ones that you invest the most energy in and time are the ones that actually are the ones that flow to the top, unless the goal's too easy <laughs> or, or is so attainable then, um, you know, often, but I also, I truly believe I pick a word of the year as well, but I pick a word of the month, I pick a word of the week and I pick a word of the day. So, and that all starts, those intentions start for me before I leave the bed in the morning. Um, so that. it sounds like we have a very similar philosophy. Um, and I think those motivate us to, to drive towards something. I love that. What's the word of the day today? Do you really want to know? Yeah. <laughs> Follow through. <laughs> Follow through. Love it. So love it. Uh, there's a lot of things that I started in the last three days that I need to finish by tomorrow. So follow through is definitely um, one of them. And it was definitely partially this interview too, considering <laughs> our alien abduction yesterday of you. <laughs> that was beyond hilarious. Yes, we attempted to do this. The internet was not uh, on our side for yeah, some reason. It was really fun. And I put it up on our <laughs> on my story because I, I, when I went back and I watched it, I was like, that is just so crazy. I've never seen something like that before. Me neither. It was like 1980s had occurred and the whole screen kind of went like, um, like it was going to go that noise. <laughs> totally. And I also was thinking about like the seventies. It's funny when you say the eighties, I was thinking even the seventies when like you had a television and the lines would go through it. It was like, I have not seen that in like forever, you know, are we broadcasting live? You know, <laughs> I mean, so crazy. Well, anyways, this was such a pleasure speaking with you. You're a wealth of knowledge. And I just love, I love how authentically real you are and how accessible you are and your ability to just touch people. Really, it's a gift. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I was so honored to meet you in New York at the UN. So lucky to to be able to join your podcast and look forward to hopefully seeing you in California this year. Oh yeah, we're celebrating your birthday. Um, but but Love it. before we leave, I want you to please, uh, my last question is actually always, what are your top five core values and how do you use them in your day-to-day -day life? Mm. I, I think my core values are... Um, to be purposeful, as you can tell, um, to ensure like I have a routine and I try my best to follow it because I feel like it gives me guidance um, to to meditate because I, I do think there's something about you grounding yourself um, in your in intention going back to that, that mm -hmm. first piece. Um, give more than people are expecting when mm -hmm. you're performing on something. Like do the extra effort, do the extra research. Uh, if you have a client, go to and prep them. Don't just go to deliver to them mm -hmm. um, because your brand is your everything. Yes. Um, and then I would say balance because mm. it, it literally is what guides me. Mm. I, I honestly, that's my biggest, one of my biggest takeaways. I mean, there's so many big takeaways from today's call, but I think balance is, um, what a gift. It's interesting. I interviewed this woman um, a, like a couple months back and she was an actress. And I, it's like, you never know what's going to show up in these calls. And in her call, it was all about control. 
And so these mm -hmm. lessons that come forward, like balance, would not be one that I would have anticipated we would have spoke about for a period of time. But uh, what a beautiful gift. And thank you so much for that. Thank you. Can't yeah. wait to see you in person. Yes. So, okay. So here's the deal. Please tell people where they can reach you and Finnovator so that if they have any questions or they want more, because I know you're all about giving back, uh, want more information about Finnovator and how they can use them, that would be amazing. Use yes. you, I should say, your services. Yes. Thank you. So Finnovator uh -huh. is a payments consultancy uh, largely focused on driving growth across North America. So work actually quite heavily in the U.S., uh, as well as the UK and Canada. Uh, you can find it at www.finnovator.com. You can find me on LinkedIn at Michelle Bayo. You can find my um, thought leadership at michellebayo.com. And uh, it was actually in a book uh, last year called Habits of Success that you can find on Amazon. I am just one chapter of 30 CEOs and founders sharing their habits of success. So quite honored to be included there. Mm. And I'm sure that your chapter is quite powerful, you know, considering everything that you've done. But thank you again for your time. And thank you, Wendy Diamond, for introducing us and for us being a part of Women's Entrepreneurship Day organization and that we're grateful that we definitely connected and met one another. Yes. Thank you so much, Rochelle. And, and thank you to Wendy Diamond uh, as well. That was such an incredible event. All right. I love you. I will talk to you soon. Love you too. Have a wonderful day. You too.